Hey folks, welcome, welcome. Um, usual drill, I want to make sure you can see me and you can hear me. So uh, uh, let's make sure that uh, all of the above. Can you hear me? Let's make sure you can see and hear me okay. Do me a favor and chime in. Let me know if you if I'm coming across. Yep. Okay, fantastic. All right. Then um Boy, some issues uh, with streaming. Hopefully it'll work out okay. I'm getting a little notification saying there are some issues, but hopefully it'll work out all right. Okay, hey Brevin, welcome, welcome. Glad you could make this. All right, well then let's go ahead and get started. So what we're doing, folks, is we are preparing for the final for Business 1050 uh, Fundamentals of or Foundations of Business Thought. Um, I'm going to totally hook you up. OK, this is the you do this and I promise you will do well in the final. First of all, in the announcement, uh, I posted a study guide to the final. Um, it follows exactly what we're going to cover today in this presentation. So the study guide is really just this presentation, but in writing format. Take notes all throughout. Even if you did not print the study guide, take notes all throughout this presentation and have that with you when you take the final. Because if you take notes through this presentation, and have that with you during the final, I promise you, you will totally rock the final, okay? It's that simple. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so here are, we're just gonna run through basically all the topics that are in the final. I mean, it's not gonna be fascinating or compelling or entertaining or engaging. It's just, I'm sending you information. Simple as that. Okay, so in preparation for the final, you need to understand what does it, what is critical thinking, all right? Um, what do we mean when we say that critical thinking is the practice of error detection in one's own thinking? Now, you'll have to get in your way back machine and remember when we talked about critical thinking. Um, another thing you can do is I did a couple of videos on um, this channel, uh, Nutshell Brainery, about critical thinking. You can go back and take a look at those. But you'll want to understand what does it mean when we say that it is the practice of error detection in our own thinking. Also, be prepared to discuss or to be able to define the difference between rhetoric, dialectic, and reasoning. Now, all these things are in the reading. What I would simply do when it comes to um, uh, rhetoric, dialectic, and reason is just go to the reading on critical thinking. Those terms are clearly called out. Just make a quick note of each one of those terms and make sure that you're ready to define those. Okay, that's critical thinking. Then you are going to be asked a bunch of questions about trade, barter, and money. So let's talk about what you'll want to have uh, ready for that. Be prepared to discuss the purpose of trade, why we trade. Remember, I have excess, but I am in want of something else. You have excess of that thing I am in want of, but you are in want of what I have excess in. So if we trade, it's a win-win. You get what you need, I get what I need, and everything comes about, and we're able to create value in so doing. Well, there is your definition, okay? Make sure that you can discuss that. Trade and business has existed throughout all, almost all of human history 
understand why this is the case. Now, those of you that were in my lecture class, you're going to remember my egg analogy when we are, you know, lending and borrowing eggs and so forth. You in the online class, let just remember what we talked about or the reading discussed at the very beginning of the semester. We have always traded because no one person can produce everything that they stand in need of. No one. That is, in fact, what makes human beings such a cohesive, community-based creature. Uh, we need each other. So trade has been around pretty much from the beginning because we need it to survive, because none of us can produce anything on our own. Um, be prepared to define barter. Don't get fancy. It's just trading stuff. At the end of this semester, you might have some textbooks that you no longer need. Somebody else can't buy a textbook, but hey, maybe they have a calculator that you need for the next class. So they'll say, hey, listen, you give me your textbook. I'll give you my calculator. I don't need it anymore. Boom, barter. That simple. Um, remember the true nature of physical money. All right. We talked about this. Um, you know, Marco Polo, there was a small Marco Polo reading that we kind of glossed over a little bit. Marco Polo found that China had invented paper money back in the 13th century. What do we mean by inventing money? Now, remember, um, money is kind of a fiction. We talked about this a little bit in our last module when we uh, talked about um, Jacob Needleman's approach to money. There's also a YouTube video uh, from a series called It's Okay to Be Smart that I have posted in the um, my, um, mycoursehub.net, mycoursehub.net. Um, I'll, I'll send this out afterwards where it talks about how money is really a fiction. It's, it, it's a symbolic abstract that we've created. So you'll want to remember that aspect of money. Um, once invented, how did money lead to the advancement of trade? Be prepared to explore some ideas. Now, for example, um, the reason money is so powerful is it is kind of universally tradable, right? So if all I'm doing is borrowing eggs or trading textbooks for um, calculators, I can only do that in my very small circle. And if I create any value, I have to go out and find somebody who wants textbooks or, or calculators or something like that. The nice thing about money is it's universally recognized for the most part. And so now trade can go far beyond our immediate community and it can be accumulated. This value, this wealth can be account accumulated and applied in different areas without having to have a storehouse full of 18 billion you know, bushels of grain. I have a million dollars, nice little piece of paper. So that is one example of how it's, you know, advanced trade. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Once invent. OK, we did that. Uh, be prepared to discuss examples provided in the reading in which money played a significant role in advancing business. OK, so what you'll want to do is look back to the reading and find examples of when money played a role in advancing business. So readings you might look at are perhaps the uh, Protestant work ethic. This kind of changed the way that we saw money. Uh, you might look at uh, the Vikings and how they applied it and so forth. Now, to that note, be prepared to discuss how the Vikings created a multinational corporation or corporations going back as far as the 10th century. Just, you know, all you don't in all of these. I know I'm getting ahead of myself in all of these. You don't need to redo the readings. 
simply go back to the responses that you provide and you provided in the assignments. Remember in the assignments, you did some multiple choice and then you did some quick write-ups. All you have to do is go back to your quick write-ups and I guarantee you the information is in there. Now, in my study guide that I provided, if you're just writing down right now as we speak one or two sentences under each one of these bullet points, trust me, you're going to be fine. So continue to take notes and refer back to the assignments that you did. You'll be good. Okay, so division of labor. labor. All right, you'll want to make sure that you can define this. Plato and, and Adam Smith both believe that everyone should specialize in one occupation. Why is that? Well, you remember all that. Nobody can do everything. I can't do everything. You can't do everything. And yet we need all these needs fulfilled. And so it makes sense that we should specialize in something so that we have a role in that community. Furthermore, the more specialized we become, the better we are, the more efficient we are, our higher the quality, the lower the costs. So it just makes sense from an economic standpoint that we would specialize. There's your answer. Okay, be prepared to define division of labor and its importance in business. You'll want to provide some examples from the readings. Um, now, Socrates, he provided some examples on why this was important. Adam Smith provided examples. Now, Socrates, that was the Plato reading. I apologize. Um, but then you can also provide examples in your own real world. I will totally accept that. Just demonstrate to me that you understand what division of labor is all about. We just defined it and why it's important. We kind of just talked about that. Again, quick little notes. Okay, be prepared to explain how division of labor influences your role in the economy and society as a whole. Okay, so think about this a little bit. Your role because of the labor in which you have selected to specialize, this has kind of influenced your role in the community. So for example, I'm a professor. Professor kind of has this haughty, sort of distinguished role in society. We have this vision of professor, um, you know, somebody who's a lawyer, we have a vision. Somebody who's a doctor, we have a vision. And yet, if we have somebody else who is an electrician or a plumber or a dental hygienist, in society, that kind of is on a weird, funky tier. And yet, all these people... They provide really awesome, solid, good value. And by the way, most of the roles that I just discussed are paid pretty much the same. Yeah, seriously. So, you know, what does this mean in terms of your role in society and your value in society? Just be prepared to play with those ideas. Okay. Business as religion. Remember, um, early on in the semester, and again, I apologize, this is for folks who were in the lecture, uh, not so much the online. In the summer and going forward, I'm going to be doing these things for every single lecture, even for the online folks. But just so you know, um, you know, in the beginning, religion was not really that trusting of business because business was, as religion saw it, driven by greed and avarice and making money and exploiting the needs of others. And religion wasn't too hip on that. They weren't too keen on these ideas. Um, but, you know, things obviously changed and we'll talk about that. So what did Tawny mean in the social organism when he said that religion tolerated economics but tried to modify it to better align with business principles. Now, you have a couple options. You can go to Tawny, you can go to that reading, and you can see real quick he has four things that he does. Or, once again, you can go to my course hub. And actually, now I just remembered, I put the link in the study guide. I put the link in the study guide, and I also put the link in um, that... Um, 
um, announcement that I did earlier. So all the information's there. You could go to the PowerPoint presentation that I linked you to, and you could look at the four things that Tawny talked about in terms of how religion and business kind of came together. They're all defined there. So I recommend that you just make a quick, like four bullets, super quick on what each one is. That will be plenty for you. Um, what group came up with the idea that people were expect um, expected to take the opportunity to make profit when it was given? Okay, this was the Puritans. This was the Protestant work ethic. So there's the answer. But make sure that you understand the answer so that when the question comes up, you kind of go, oh, 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 I see. I see what they're talking about. Remember, religion did not trust um, business that much, but the Protestants came along and really kind of flipped it on its head. The Protestants came up with this idea through Calvinism that not only is business okay, it is religiously, spiritually expedient. You have to engage in good business in order to go to heaven. So it was the Puritans that came up with the idea that, hey, if you're given an opportunity to make profit, you're morally obligated to search after that opportunity. Okay. Capitalism and free market systems. Obviously, the class talked a lot about um, uh, capitalism and so forth. Um, its pros and its cons and its problems and its solutions. We're going to cover all these. Make sure that we understand these things. So the first one, the economic revolution, according to Hellbronner, he said that the market system with its essential components of land, labor, capital was born in agony, an agony which began in the 13th century and did not run its course until well into the 19th. What did he mean by this? Now, remember, you can go to my presentation where I actually have that quote on the very front page and we talk about it. The reason it was born in agony is because we now have these new ideas of market systems. We can no longer force people to do what we want them to do or do it by tradition. We're going to come back to this. Furthermore, we need labor and we need capital, and yet labor and capital are always fighting you know, against each other. We're also very concerned about the idea of letting this free market system decide really important things. Um, so this kind of freaked everybody out for quite a long time. Make sure you understand that quote and what it's all about. Okay, today people, for the most part, can choose their vocation their job, their career. Um, but that wasn't always the case. In the past, tradition and authoritarian rule ran the show. What do these terms mean? Well, remember, and again, I apologize to my online students because we didn't discuss this in the online, but I gave the example of my last name. My last name is Schiffbauer, which means shipbuilder in German. So that's an example of tradition where roles and jobs and careers are passed down through the family. It's just tradition. This is why we see a lot of Smiths, because everybody needed a Smith. And we see a lot of Tanners, and we see a lot of other jobs built into the name. That's tradition. Authoritarian rule is good old-fashioned slavery. We're talking indentured servitude. We're talking forced labor. And so in the past, the way we got things done was through forced labor or through the tradition of the family. Well, today we can do anything. You can do anything you want. That Well, not anything, but you get what I'm saying. That's why you're in school, so you can do something else. Um, make sure you make a quick note of the definition of those two things, why they are what they are, tradition and authoritarian rule. Okay. Be prepared to define and discuss the difference between the owners of capital and the laboring class. You know, owners of capital own the land, they own the factories, they own the means of production. The means of production. Whereas the laboring class, all they have to sell is their labor. 
that's it. And so, you know, you need a lot of labor, but you need capital and capital needs labor, labor needs capital, so on and so forth. Make sure you kind of understand the mindset and the needs of these two classes. Again, not in mega detail, all right? If you just wrote down what I just said, you'll be fine. Okay, be prepared to discuss the Industrial Revolution, in particular the manufacturing of cotton in the 1700s. Just refer back to the assignment that you did on mill times and, you know, make a note that, yes, Industrial Revolution brought in, you know, cities and, you know, they built mills and they were concerned about power and they brought together people to have... Um, uh, economies of scale and so forth. So long as you just kind of remember those things, you'll be fine. Okay. In The Wealth of Nation, Adam Smith said a country should not produce something that it can buy cheaper from a foreign country. Why would this make sense? Well, you'll remember that if we want to make sure that we are efficient in everything that we do, and this leads up to the invisible hand, which we'll talk about here in, in one moment, that, you know, we want to get everything we can as cheap as possible. That way we are conservative with our resources. So if it takes me $20 to make something here, but I can buy it for $10 somewhere else, just the whole economy dictates that I get it for $10 so that I can take that other $10 that I have and invest it somewhere else. That's what capitalism is all about. Um, which brings us to this. Be prepared to define and discuss the five aspects of capitalism. Profit motive, private capital, free market, laissez-faire, and the invisible hand. One bullet for each will be enough. Remember, Profit motive is you can never have enough. You always want more. So you're going to always strive to get more. It will push you forward. Um, private capital, I have this money. I need to invest it. This is the Protestant work ethic, the Puritans. You should invest in an opportunity because investment brings about growth and jobs and economic prosperity. Um, free market. Let competition do what it'll do. Don't control every, anything by the federal government. Let the free market take control because competition brings about lower prices, higher quality, and greater functionality. Um, Laissez-faire, don't get involved. Don't regulate. Don't put laws, rules, and regulations in way. It will only stifle economic growth. You want to let the free market, you know, kind of do this. Remember, we talked about how this is kind of the way that the natural world works and evolution and survival of the fittest. Just let the natural systems do what they do. And then invisible hand is everybody will prosper if everybody works in their own best self-interest. OK, I know it sounds counterintuitive, right? But the idea is my students will profit if I become a professor and work really hard to become a better professor for my own self-interest, although you will profit. I will profit from you when you attend my classes. Right now, I'm concerned about the summer because we're not getting a lot of students signing up for summer because they're all online classes. And therefore, I stand to lose. So I want my students to work in their own best self-interest and to want to get through school quickly and to get some easy credits and so forth and sign up for summer so that I can benefit. That's the invisible hand. All right. Be prepared to discuss Potter's take on the economic system. Easy. Just go into the link I have for my course hub and pull up the American economic system, the one by, by David Potter, and you'll see, you know, he says, well, we have a blend between the capitalist system and the controlled system of, say, socialism, because 
we make sure that some things that bring about greater opportunity for Americans and for growth in their standard of living and for, you know, um, egalitarian reasons, we make sure that those things have more of a socialist bent. So, for example, our uh, schooling, K through 12, is 100 percent, you know, funded by taxpayers, which means it's a you know, public system and and socialist in nature. However, we dig that in the U.S. because we want um, equal opportunity for everyone to get a basic education. So go back to the um, presentation, do a quick review of those, and you'll be fine. Okay. In fact, if you are, if your memory is jogged by what I just said, you're already fine. Okay. Troubles with capitalism, all right? Um, according to Karl Marx, what does he believe? Why does he believe that the more a worker produces, the poorer he becomes? Well, think about it. If all you're doing is selling your labor, well, think about your job. Let's say that you work hourly and you kind of are measured by what you produce or your throughput time or how many customers you serve or something like that. The more you produce, the more efficient you are, the more money you make for your employer. But you don't make any more money. Now, maybe you get some bonuses. Maybe you get some growth opportunities. Maybe you get some kudos and some gift cards, which is awesome, seriously. But what Marx is talking about is, listen, the harder you work, the more you produce, the more you are giving your labor to the employer with which to make money and the less you benefit from it. Because if I produce 10 units an hour, but then I go up to 12 units an hour, I am making less per unit than I was before, but the, but the employer is making more. That was Marx's gripe. Uh, still working, Mike Lefebvre. Oh, we love Mike Lefebvre, right? Cannot see the result of his labor. How does this affect his ability to take pride in his work? And what would Marx call this? Now, real quick, I'd love to see somebody just type the one word in in the um in the comments there. What would Marx call it when somebody cannot see themselves in the result of their labor and therefore cannot take pride in that labor. They feel some sort of, you know, separation, like they're no longer part of what they produce. Come on, somebody can type it in there. When you type it in there, we'll come back to it because that's the answer to the question. Um, in Lady Chatterley's Lover, um, there we go, Vanessa. Bing, 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 bing. Okay, virtual kudos to Vanessa. Yes, alienation. We feel alienated from um, our labor, right? And, and therefore, we don't really feel connected and we can't take pride in it. We can't say, yeah, Riley, that's it exactly. We can't say, I did that. I made that. We say, eh, well, I worked on some of the steel, I guess. I sort of, I don't know. That's exactly right. Everyone take note of that. Okay. In Lady Chatterley's Lover, what does Clifford believe is the responsibility of the factory owner, the wealthy? Does he believe he should just give money to the poor? No. Because remember, one of the things Clifford said is, you know, something along the lines of if you give money, you know, if you give all your wealth to the poor, then the then everybody becomes poor because the poor will not use the money properly. This is what he said. I'm not saying this is true because I disagree. Nevertheless, he said the poor won't use the money properly. And now I don't have a factory by which I can then employ these people. So he felt the responsibility of the factory owner was not to give money to the poor, but to run the factory as efficiently as he can so that he can employ these people. Now, I'm not saying there isn't logic to this. In fact, let's say it, there is a lot of logic to this. 
However, the way he did it and the philosophy and ethics by which he did it were re pretty repugnant, okay? Okay. Um, what's Mahatma Gandhi's gripe with machinery? Why doesn't he like machines? Well, in fact, if you'll remember, it's not that he doesn't like machines. He doesn't like the idea that automation would replace a human being. Remember, if you create a machine that facilitates your work, makes your work more enjoyable, like a singer sewing machine, he's all for it. But if the job, if the technology replaces a human being, he does not like that. Okay? The idea that we would put efficiency ahead of humanity to him is just nuts. Okay. Um, according to CPG Gray, he's the guy who did the video on humans need not apply. Which type of jobs in, are in danger because of automation? Well, I'll just go ahead and tell you, if you remember from the video, all the jobs, they're all in danger. It's not just, hey, you know, you're a laborer or production or it's easy to, you know, kind of, you know, replicate. No, he says everybody's pretty much at risk. All right. Why wouldn't Leonard Reed in iPencil agree that modern industrial work is degrading and exploitive? Now, remember, iPencil is all about the invisible hand. It is an essay and a video um, that kind of exemplifies the invisible hand. Well, Reed probably wouldn't feel like it's exploited because everybody's playing a part in it and everybody can change what they do and adjust what they do. Okay, fine. In theory, that's true. If people have the means, if you do not have the money or access to wealth or access to mobility or access to education or any of these things, no, you're pretty much exploited. Um, but he would disagree. All right. Remember, we talked about some potential solutions to these problems. We're not anti-capitalist in this class. We're also not anti-socialist in this class. We are just like Potter says, we're kind of a blend in our own world and we're trying to find the best possible solutions. Well, Andrew Carnegie, uh, he had some solutions. You know, he wanted to improve the relationship between labor and capital. Now, there were four ways that he wanted to improve the relationship. Go back to the presentation at um, mycoursehub.net. The link is in the announcement and in the study guide. And pull up the one on Andrew Carnegie and Employer's Worldview. And you'll see on a slide the four things he says we need to do. You know, you need to... Uh, um, you need to have pay that scales with profit. You need to have um, really good managers, not just dipwads off the street that are connected to you through DNA. Um, you need to um, have um, good negotiations and open communication and no stoppage of work and all that sort of stuff. Take a look at those four things. Just make a quick note of them. Okay. How does our Andrew Carnegie and employers view the question, labor question? What does he mean when he says that managers are not owners and so have little interest in the welfare of workers? Well, remember, as progressive as Carnegie was, and he was progressive for his day, um, he 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 felt that in order for somebody to really care about the outcome of something, they needed to have a vested ownership interest in the venture. And so since employees and managers by and large don't own the company, there's less, you know, reason for managers, employees to really, you know, invest of themselves emotionally and time-wise and so forth in the outcome of the venture. So just kind of bear that in mind. All right. We're almost there, folks. We're almost there. I'm telling you this is going to work. 
science of management. Be prepared to discuss the people, Fail, Taylor, and McGregor, and what their contributions were to the science of management. So remember, Fail is the one who said management has to be a distinct skill set, and the job of a manager is to manage the you know, the body corporate. Taylor is the one who did the time motion studies. He's the one who figured out exactly how much time it took to do how much work with how much motion and basically turned people into components of a machine in that way. And then McGregor is the one who said, no one management style works in every situation. There, it, you need situational leadership. Sometimes people need to be consoled. Sometimes they need to be chided. Sometimes they need to be encouraged. Sometimes they need to be rewarded. Sometimes you need to negotiate. That's what these three people did. Be prepared to discuss how management was conducted before management, you know, scientific management was introduced. Well, it was whatever people found in holy writ, such as the Bible and, you know, the Talmud and the Quran and whatever military leaders had written about. So, you know, art of war and so on and so forth. So if you remember, and it was Fail who talks about this, um, as well as McGregor, you know, there was just too much assumption made that, well, if it works on a battlefield, it must work in a corporate office. No, it doesn't. Why do you think fail in general and in industrial management would say that allowing employees to exercise initiative is a great source of strength for the business? Well, because when people are allowed to exercise initiative, they use their innovation, they use their creativity, they, they you know, problem solve, they invest of themselves in it. Pretty simple, straightforward. Just write down what I said, you'll be fine. Okay, um, why would McGregor in Methods of Influence and Control say that authority will not always work as a means of control in the workplace? Are there other ways to influence people besides authority? Well, remember, and you can go back to the presentation on this one, there's lots of ways to influence people. You know, there's authority, but then there's also personal sources of power, such as expert power and reverent power and network power, remember? So, no, you can influence people without authority. You can influence them because they look up to you and you have expertise and you're well-connected. Okay, be prepared to discuss the merits of situational leadership. It's pretty simple. When there's a different situation, you bring to bear a different leadership style and you can bring about a different result. So, for example, when there's a crisis going on, I want to be told exactly what to do, when, and how to do it. Whereas when there's something that's kind of fun and exciting of, you know, going on, I just want to know what, re what the end result should look like and then be left alone to do it however I want to do it. Situational leadership. Be prepared to define Taylor's time and motion studies. We kind of already referred to that. That's where they time out how long does it take to do this, you know, and if we put something up high and they have to reach for it, well, if we were to put it lower, they don't have to reach for it as much. And if the bottle is this big, it they're clumsy with it, whereas if we make the bottle smaller, it's easier to maneuver. Again, it's really breaking down every single aspect of production into very, very, very small, specific, measurable actions, and then putting all that together for an assembly line. Um, there was your answer. By the way, here's a freebie, um, because in the online classes, we never, I'm sorry, in the lecture classes, we never discussed this. And maybe in the online, you didn't catch it. So I'm just going to give it to you. The concepts of credit, debit, ledger, inventory, and double entry accounting came from Lusa Pacioli. Pacioli. 
15th century. There you go. That's a question. There's the answer. All right. We're almost there. Bear with me. Consumerism. There's going to be some questions on consumerism. Be prepared to discuss the important ways in which the purpose of business has changed from ancient times to now. For example, in ancient times, it was, I need sheep. Well, I need hay. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some of my sheep for some of your hay. That way we're all meeting needs. So it was all about meeting our physiological needs so that we can, you know, survive, thrive, raise a family, just meet our needs. It's not about meeting needs anymore. It's about having stuff. Okay. Uh, I have a, a slick mug. I have a, an NPR mug. I have an X-Men mug. Now, I have a whole lot of other mugs, too. They're just not right here and ready. Why do I need 18 mugs? I don't need 18 mugs. It was just cool. Remember, we're consuming now for purposes other than just meeting our needs. We're consuming for a lot of other reasons, which we're going to talk about. What does Galbraith mean by contrived wants? Remember, a contrived want is when you really don't want it. It's just you've been convinced that you want it. Or worse still, when it's a contrived need, where you didn't even know it existed before, but now you need it, okay? Um, so, for example, um, oh, I put the other camera away. I bought a new camera. I got this new camera, and it's going to allow me to live stream in high definition. So it's really nice. And it's going to allow me to do some cool new things for my videos. Um, do I really need that? <sighs> no, not really. But I wanted it. All right. And I... I was I convinced myself I wanted it because of the functionality. It's not that this functionality sucks. This is working fine. And my videos have been working fine. But now, oh, I can do so much more. Oh, really? Is that part of your job? No, this is a hobby. Really? I'm spending this much money on a freaking hobby? Yeah, that's a contrived want. Okay. Be prepared to discuss why Galbraith doesn't believe that increased production doesn't necessarily mean the country is better off. Well, because you're producing stuff that the country really doesn't need. You don't need a little putting green that goes around your toilet so that when you're sitting on the can, you can putt. You don't need that. And yet we are investing scarce resources into producing that kind of nonsense, right? So no, just because we're producing more doesn't mean we're better off. According to Veblen in Pecuniary Emulation, why do people accumulate and display their wealth to others? Well, we want to show off. Remember, our wealth makes us look successful. And if we look successful, people will infer that we must be intelligent or cagey or clever or just hardworking. And so really, by me having something, I can't find anything in my office that is pecuniary emulation. I don't know, maybe that camera. But if I wear these things and show off these things, then others will assume that I'm smart, successful, and hardworking, and that will allow me to have more influence in society. There's your answer. Um, be prepared to discuss. Uh, let's see. According, okay, here's it is. Um, in what ways do O. Henry in the Romance of a Busy Broker and Jacob Needleman from the Bill Moyers interview assert that you shouldn't let the pursuit of money take over your life? Remember, both Needleman and O. Henry kind of cautioned us against making money our North Star. You know, life is rich and full and vast and varied and diverse. And yet, if all we're doing is investing of ourselves in the pursuit of money, we're going to live a shallow life. That's what these folks asserted. Okay, last one. 
be prepared to discuss how socially responsible actions, as discussed in The Greening of Corporate America, are often in a company's own best interest. We talked about this in our last lecture. The, you know, basically, if you're socially responsible, you're going to waste less. You're going to have better reputation with your customers. You will be able to get better deals. You'll be able to increase sales. You will be able to save money and yada, yada, yada. It's pretty darn straightforward and simple. And that, folks, is it. Oh, my gosh. I'm if. There's still 10 people with us. You are nut jobs. All right. I know that was all really dry. It was just an hour of me doing this crap. But again, if you make notes on all those things, refer to a PowerPoint presentation now and again, just to make sure your notes are good and refer back to some of the things that you submitted and have that study guide with you when you take the test. I promise you, you'll ace it. It's that simple. Um, simply put, I pretty much pointed you in all the right directions. So you're going to be good. Um, let's see. Um, any questions? This is pretty much our last time together, folks. Um, it, no, it looks like Brevin, you're all set. Yeah, we're not lecturing anymore. There's nothing more to go over. You're going to do the final. You're going to submit your papers. You're going to put things in your e-portfolio. You're going to be totally set. So, yeah, that's it for us. Um, yeah, uh, or, or campus. Uh, no, no, the final is online, Vanessa. Thank you for asking. The final is completely online. It's not on campus. So you just go in. Um, let's see when it is scheduled to start. In fact, I'm going to pull up, pull it up. If you just bear with me one moment. All right. And here, let's pull it back over to this so you can see it. So let's see when the final is scheduled. The syllabus. Come on, catch up. Here we go. Final exam. Okay, from May 2nd to May 5th. You know what? Why can't we do it now? Here, let's do this. Edit. And uh, what's today, folks? Today's the 27th. Okay. Save. The final's open. You can take it anytime you want. So consolidate your notes, get it all together, move on in there, and you will be set. As you notice, I took off the time limits. There's no time limit. Um, that said, don't start the final, walk away, come back in seven hours, and then be shocked that somehow something crashed. Don't do that, okay? Go ahead and sit down and take it. You'll be in good shape. Okay. Um, what other questions? Looks like we're good. Campus all sorted. Okay. I'm going to make sure that that is... All right. I don't. Let's see. No. OK, Anna, you betcha. You're welcome. I don't see any other questions coming in. So, OK. Is there an essay? Right. So, Vanessa, the 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 essay. Oh, um, as one of the questions. OK. Yes. So good question, Vanessa. The final and it's listed here. Um, the final is um, four essay questions and then 40 multiple choice questions. But again, everything we just went over, you will be prepped for all of them. That's why that this thing was so freaking long. Okay. Any other questions? 
And Ethan, if you're still with us, yeah, at 10 o'clock, I'm going to do a Zoom for the uh, Business 2200 class. Vanessa, cool. Yeah, cool. Okay. Anna, you have a great summer too. All right. It looks like we are all set. So um, everyone, thank you for attending. Thank you for a great semester. And uh, we'll see you around. Have a good one.